Well, there's a couple things. The, the biggest thing, and, and my my favorite saying is, everybody wants the results. Nobody wants the process, right? Everybody wants to be a black belt, but not everybody's willing to put in the work to become a black belt. Everybody says they want to be an instructor, a manager, an owner, but maybe they're not willing to put in the work, right? When they watch me do what I do, they see the glamour moment. They see me standing out there, running the class, rocking it, everything's firing all cylinders. They don't understand sometimes how much work, effort, and dedication I put into my craft to be able to do what it is that I do. Hey, this is George Free, and welcome to another Martial Arts Media Business Podcast. Today I'm joined with, so this is going to be a long list of credentials, so I'm going to have to cut this down. So I'm with Chris Casamassa, so author, actor, business consultant, school owner. What am, what am I leaving out there, Chris? Uh, serial entrepreneur. Serial entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah. All right, awesome. Well, well welcome to the show. Um, so I'm going to be speaking with Chris at the main event in San Diego, depending on when you're watching and listening to this, that'll be the 26th to 28th of April. And today we're just going to have a, a chat. Chris has obviously got a wealth of knowledge, so we might this conversation might be part one and two. We'll we'll see how we go. <laughs> All right, Chris. So so welcome. I guess for for people that have, might not have heard of you, who is Chris Casamassa? Uh, Chris Casamassa is, uh, I'm the son of the Grand Master of Red Dragon Karate. We have 12 locations in Southern California. We've been in business since 1965. So this is our 53rd year in business. Like I said, my father started our company. We are classified as a mixed martial arts style because my dad didn't like one martial arts style. He loved them all. He actually holds black belts in 10 different styles of martial arts. So in the 1960s, he did something that really was unheard of and he combined styles of martial arts. Uh, so he's one of the originators of the mixed martial arts. Everybody who has a mixed martial arts school, you're welcome. Uh, yeah, we, he did that a long, long time ago and he is a, a, an awesome, awesome, amazing guy. Ton of great stories about how people used to come and challenge him because you weren't allowed to do those things back in the day. Uh, but, but he was doing it before it was cool. And, and so that's kind of where I grew up. Uh, I started martial arts training when I was four years old and I've been in it my entire life, uh, and really just fell in love with it at a, at a, at a very young age. All right, so so growing up in martial arts the, the way you did, what do you feel, I, I mean, and, and I, I spoke about this with uh, Zolfi Ahmed, you know, where uh, the, the conscious, uh, conscious competence and unconscious wow. incompetence and so forth. And, you know, obviously he's got a wealth of knowledge as well as yourself of experience that's, that's become such a part of you that you might, it might be hard to sort of define it to one thing. But what do you feel has been the biggest learning for you growing up through your dad and, and within the martial arts industry the way you have? The biggest learning for me, do you mean that what's the biggest benefit I've personally gotten out of it? Yes. Okay. That would be the ability, two things. One, the ability to believe in yourself that you can and to never give up on your dreams and hopes and goals. Probably those are the two biggest things that my father instilled in me that the arts have taught me. Uh, really that nothing is impossible as long as you are focused and you take the steps of progression that you need to get there. You just give it 100% effort and never give up. All right, so so you, you started martial arts at a very young age. At what point did you start sort of an instructor role and, and stepping stepping into the operations of the school? Uh, really, when I was young, probably when I was about 15, uh, I started teaching a little bit here and there. and. Uh, and pretty much since I was 16, 17 years old, it's been something I've done full time. Literally, I would walk home from school. Uh, to, I didn't even go home. I went from school to the studio where my dad was at. And I taught there, did my homework there, uh, and then went home at 8 or 9 o'clock every night and uh, kind of just blended into a lifestyle for me. All right. Now, lots have happened since then. Um, how oh, yeah. did you <laughs> – give us a bit of a breakdown. How did, how did you step into the whole um, – the movie role and you know Mortal Kombat and and taking on that whole actor career between okay. all this. Yeah, that actually is a great question, and it goes back to what I talked about about focus and goal setting and believing yourself, right? So, uh, when I was in my early teens, of course, like many people around that time, Bruce Lee, of course, was my big action hero. You know, Enter the Dragon, all those movies that he did uh, really inspired me to say, "Hey, I want to try and do this." 
on screen than the movies. And when we were younger, me and my brothers used to make little homemade fight videos of like ninja stuff. And yeah, we played all kinds of, I got some great old videotape for anybody watching. If you wonder what video is, uh, but if that's something I always wanted to do. Right. So I also started competing, uh, when I was 17, 18 years old, like on the circuit, there's a pro tour in the United States called the North American sport karate association. So I went out on that tour and decided I wanted to get better as a competitor because ultimately honing my skills would just make me look better and sharper as far as doing martial arts, period. But then if I wanted to ever be on camera, if I wanted to be a Chuck Norris or if I wanted to be a Bruce Lee, I had to try and look as good, as fast, as powerful as those guys did. So I knew I could, through tournament competition, very, very much hone my skills. Uh, and I spent almost a decade out on the pro tour. And when I retired, I was the four-time number one open forms champion, like four years in a row. I was the best forms competitor in the world. So that right there helped open another door for me because when I won a tournament in Atlanta, Georgia called the Battle of Atlanta, which at the time was one of the biggest events in the country, there were some producers from a TV show in the audience that came up to me and a few other guys and asked us if we'd be interested in doing a TV show. So one door kind of helped to open another door. Like I didn't start with Mortal Kombat. That was that was kind of that my third, maybe fourth or fifth film that I did. Uh, but I, I started small with small shows, small TV shows. And just kind of work my way up. And then in the movie business, there's an old saying that um, it's not who you know, it's who knows you. And that really is true because once you get your foot in the door and you establish yourself and you have a good relationship and you're not a jerk to work with, then people want to continue to work with you. You do good work. You don't complain. You, you make it look good. You make the stars look good. And then you take those stepping stones and move up. So that's how I was able to kind of take martial arts, turn it into competition, and turn it into a movie and TV career. All right, fantastic. So now looking at that, you and, and, and just relating to, you know, perhaps the average martial arts school owner, you know, someone perhaps starting out or going from at one school to the next school, you've been in, in, instilled a lot of confidence into into you growing up the way you did. How do you how do you work with people that experience the obstacles? You know, you, you do the goal setting and that, that's sort of where you want to go. But I guess you reach this point of, you know, the, the whole, um, can I, a, a bit of self doubt, you know, how do I, how do I break through from this next barrier to the next? Well, if you're talking about martial arts business owners or martial arts school owners, listen, yes. nowadays it is so much easier and, and so much uh, simpler to become successful in the martial arts because there's guys like you, there's guys like me that are out there that weren't out there, right? If you, if you've been around for a while, you go back to the 80s and 90s, everyone was closed off. Like, I don't want to share my knowledge with you. Everybody was very closed-minded. Where the martial arts and the business, at least in the United States that I've seen so far, it's become more of an open mind where we're trying to raise the level of our industry, right? Our industry has had such a bad rap on the business side for so long, and so few people have had the, the secret and the keys to success. Now more and more people are getting because there's guys like you, there's guys like me that are out there sharing our knowledge, sharing our understanding of how this business can work and how it can be successful to raise the standard of the industry. So if there's anybody out there struggling, if there's a wealth of free knowledge, like they could follow you, they could follow me on social media, all these things that didn't exist just a decade ago, there's so many tools available. Like almost, I can almost say like, if you're failing in your martial arts business now, like you're just dumb. Like you're not paying any attention to what's out there. And I, and I don't mean that insulting wise, like there's a wealth of information out there that was never available before just the free stuff. And of course there's coaching and consulting and business guys, and you got to weed out some of the, some of the bad guys from the good guys, which is also hard to do. And I've got a few tips on that, but, uh, it, in the business today, like I wish I was starting out today because the transition from, from good to great is much smoother and easier now for the people that really want to go get it. Definitely. So, well, let's explore that weeding out the good from the bad, because that's, I mean, that's something, uh, that, that comes up a lot. And, I guess from just the, the time in the last five years that I've started helping martial arts school owners, it's, it's probably the place where I've seen the most consultants and experts that, that deliver information. And I guess a lot of that is based on a little success, you know, not people like yourself that has gone the long yards and have seen the ups and downs and seen the different transitions. So right. what advice would you give to someone that's really looking for good advice, but just not sure who to trust? Two things. One, 
references and testimonials. So if somebody says, well, I've gotten these many people, this many results, find out who those people are and talk to them. Send them a message on Facebook or send them an email and say, how has this person helped you? What has been great about this experience, right? So if somebody doesn't have social proof, then there's a big flag right there. Somebody's just got a sales page saying, I've helped hundreds of people get thousands of students, but there's no actual testimonials on that page. I'd be running away from that. Second of all, if they have a fully functional business, get a, get a chance to take a look at it, right? Like we've got 12 locations. We've been around for 53 years. You know, my main school has over almost 400 active members in it. So it's not, I'm not telling you what to do because I'm guessing. I tell you what to do because this is exactly how I do what I do and why it works. So there's a method behind my, my madness. What I say is my systems have systems. So if something defaults, there's a system to fall back on. it. So those are the kind of things that you got to look at. All right, fantastic. So Chris, a day in the life of Chris, you, you're running, you, you mentioned 13 locations? 12. 12 locations. Okay. Yeah. So, so what does that look like in, obviously you can't have your hands on everything. What does that look like in a day for you to manage and, and operate? Well, listen, I couldn't do this by myself. I've got a great team in place uh, that helps us keep things running smooth, right? Uh, it's kind of like a duck, you know, on the surface, it looks smooth, but underneath everybody's feet are paddling really, really fast to, to keep it going uh, in there. But uh, yeah, you're right. I, there's no way I could do this by myself. I have a, a fantastic team in place. My dad, some of my dad's core people are still involved with our company today. Uh, so they understand all the nuts and bolts, bolts, nuts and bolts of how our business is run. And, uh, and you know, like I said, it's, you got to surround yourself with a good support team. So my job really, the main thing is I train the trainers, right? My job is to make sure that the people that are going out into the schools that are managing or owning their own individual locations are doing and saying and teaching the right things the right way to continue to help the business excel grow and make the students improve so I, i've got a pretty cool spot right now is i'm a trainer's trainer trainer's trainer all right so so let's break that down so it really comes down to your leadership and the team's leadership so so where do you where do you really start that journey of developing leaders at white belt so right right when they start regardless of their age ultimately we we try and grow all of our instructors and trainers and future managers and owners in-house and they come up through our system, they come up through our ranks because again, they're the product of what we're selling, right? So it's, it's challenging and we're experimenting with, with bringing people in from outside of our company because I, I do wanna open it up and, and expand it more, but our easiest and best growth and best managers and owners always come from the inside, we're growing them. We call it bench strength, right? So the goal is to develop the bench strength on our team so that every person on the team is replaceable and no matter who's here or who's not here, the wheel just keeps turning and keeps moving. So, so how do you, and so you started white belt, but at, at what point, what would be the first steps you would take to, to push someone towards the leadership role? Uh, it's very easy. We have a leadership program built into our program. So as they escalate and they get about halfway to the path of black belt, they, if they're interested in that, they receive an invitation into our leadership training. And then again, we're very fortunate in the fact that we built this, we have instructor colleges. So, uh, four times a year, anybody that's interested in having a job inside of a Red Dragon school has to attend our instructor colleges. After they attend uh, four to six instructor colleges, we give them a written exam, then a physical exam. And if they pass all of that, then they're certified as what we call a level one instructor. So technically any one of our Red Dragon schools could hire them as an assistant. They work inside the school and they work there. So there's, there's platform building all the way through. You start, you know, as an assistant instructor, then you go to a floor instructor and then a floor manager, then a head instructor, and then, you know, then a manager of a school. And then if you want to take that step, there's ownership uh, possibilities for you. So it's all platform based. And just like going from white belt to black belt, there are clearly defined outline steps. The same thing on the internal, on the business side of what we do, those same steps are in place. All right, great. So what obstacles do you experience with this? Because I mean, you, you're already at 13 locations, I'm sure. 1 to 13, there were a lot of bumps in the road. What are, this, what are the general obstacles you've overcome, well, you experience on a day-to-day -day basis and within your, if not so much current, what, what are you really experiencing within that whole growth phase? Well, there's a couple things. The, the biggest thing and, and my, my favorite saying is everybody wants the results, nobody wants the process, right? Everybody wants to be a black belt, but not everybody's willing to put in the work to become a black belt. Everybody says they want to be an instructor or a manager or an owner, but maybe they're not willing to put in the work, right? 
when they watch me do what I do, they see the glamour moment. They see me standing out there, running the class, rocking it, everything's firing all cylinders. They don't understand sometimes how much work, effort, and dedication I put into my craft to be able to do what it is that I do. Now, there are those that are going through the path and they're in the process and they're going through it, but that's overall my biggest challenge to answer your question is, everybody wants the results, nobody wants the process, and a lot of younger people today don't have the patience to get there, to take that next step. They think that, oh, I'm a black belt, I should start making $30, $40 an hour, be paid you know, $100,000 a year to do this. They don't have the patience to do the work, to get better, to get the rewards. Definitely so, and, and I guess, Chris, that's the way of the world today. I mean, you, you come from, you know, the, you walked a long path to achieve your success, and as, as easier it's become with access to social media and, and access inf accessing information, the problem with accessing information is it's so much easier to see the end result that someone's achieved and you don't always recognize the journey that it's taken and the obstacles. And right. I guess that brings it to this whole instant gratification with, with the younger generation. It's right. Well, that's what they're doing. They haven't committed their 10,000 hours or, or whatever it is, but just, I want that result. Right. Yeah, listen, it, it's the same thing. I mean, if you look at, uh, like there's, a, I don't know, in, in Australia, uh, but on YouTube, there's uh, two brothers, Logan Paul and Jake Paul, who are just monsters on social media and social interaction, right? And they're young guys. But what you don't see is they put in years of work to build up to their million or two million followers to get those 20, 30 million views of these crazy, goofy videos that they do but people are responding to it, right? So if you're doing something good that people respond to, you're gonna move up. If you're doing something that's not good and people aren't responding to it, then maybe you're in the wrong line of work. Maybe you're in the wrong business. Not everyone is cut out for this type of business. Every, you gotta follow your passion, right? I'm doing this because I love it. You're doing what you do probably because you love it, right? You love sharing your knowledge and people respond to that passion. They feel it. They know it and they understand it and they're like, yeah, that's the guy I want to have help me. That's the guy I want to have train me or train my kids because it comes from here, it comes from my heart. And you probably can't see me because it's a podcast. I'm touching my heart. But it, it comes from there first. And if it comes from there and it's pure, then everything else is going to be so much easier to get. Fantastic. So where do you start? If you if you help if you're helping a school owner scale and you know, with their operations or their marketing, what is the what is the sort of the, the benchmark where you start and evolve from? Well, it, it's, it's called the snowflake principle. Every school owner that I coach and consult outside of my company starts somewhere different because everyone has different needs. So it starts with me with an interview process, right? I'll spend 30 minutes, an hour with them on the phone, talking to them about all the systems that they have or don't have in place, finding out what their biggest needs are first, whether it's new members or keeping old members, whether it's like what you do, marketing systems, Facebook, social media interaction. So I've got to really interview and dig down and understand the person to make sure two things. One, I understand completely what they need. And number two, I believe that I can help them because ultimately if, if I talk to somebody, I'm going to be honest with them. Look, I can help you if we implement X, Y, and Z, or it, they might be in a spot where, listen, I'm not the guy for you, but I might know someone who is. Right? So that's, that's kind of where I start and my approach to it is I need to get to know the person that I'm, that I'm coaching so that I can help them reach their goals. All right, great. So, Chris, I feel we, we're probably sort of scratching the surface of your, of your wealth of knowledge. And I, I want to talk a bit about the main event, what you do on the, on the speaking platform. But, mm -hmm. and, and, and this is sort of the, the cliche question, right? But is, is, there, is there a question I should be asking you and steering you towards that, that we're not covering as, as yet? No, actually, what I'm going to be covering at the main event that we're coming up, uh, and that's in San Diego, is pretty much that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give the school owners and the managers there actionable things that they can implement in their business to help grow their business faster with new members. So there's so many things that many school owners aren't doing in the on, what I call the onboarding process or their first 100 days. A way to turn a satisfied customer into a happy customer, because here's the difference. Satisfied customers don't refer members to your school happy customers refer everyone. So it's ultimately taking a customer from a satisfied state to a happy state. The processes that we use to do it and the processes that we use actually to help over 100,000 people 
become happy customers inside of our business. Well, fantastic. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the first 100 days. It's, it's something I've spoken about in our, our Martial Arts Media Academy program as well. And something we try and really practice, you know, how you can really, the, the first 100 days, what type of impact you can make. If, if you were to break it down, what, just a, a level deeper, what, at, at what extent do you go within the first 100 days how you would handle a, a student coming on board with your program? That's a great question, and that's probably a whole nother 30-minute conversation. And really, what that question you just asked is perfect, because that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about in San Diego on April 26th through the 28th. So if there's anybody listening that wants to get there, I will go through those exact processes. Like, I'm going to show you uh, how to get someone to give you an awesome review instead of a crappy review. I'm going to show you how to onboard them and surprise them with things that they won't get in any other martial arts school, let alone any other business. Um, so it's, it's little tips and secrets like that, that make all the difference between a satisfied customer and a happy customer. So we'll, we'll cover it in part two after the event. Other than that, you've got to come to San Diego, April 26th through the 28th. All right. Awesome. That, that sounds great because I, and I might, I might take you on for a second interview when I meet you in person, depending of course on the time, it's a, it's a big event and so forth, but it'd be great to, it'd be great to see you on stage and, and, and really gather some information and then perhaps we can do a part two and, and really discuss discuss a few few more topics in depth. Yeah, man, I'm, ha- I'm happy to do it. Happy to, always happy to help. Listen, if, if just one person listening to the podcast is, is effective in a positive way from listening to this, then then that's great. You know, obviously I want to help hundreds and hundreds of school owners, but hey, it starts with one, right? All right, fantastic. So before we go, Chris, what's, what's next for you in your martial arts journey? Uh, next is my, my real, my, not my real, but my new, my mission, my passion, and my purpose is, and again, I don't know how it is in Australia, but in the United States, there's a really big problem with bullying. I, I just wrote a book, which became a number one bestseller called Bullyproof Fitness. It's available on Amazon worldwide, I believe. Um, but my, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get a million kids bullyproof and fit by the year 2025. Right now, I'm at 50,000. So I've taught 50,000 kids so far. I go around to local martial arts schools all over the world, and I do these live bully event seminars to help these kids understand what a bully is, what it's not, and what they can do if it happens to them. Because so many people don't have the tools, they don't know what it is. Even kids that are in martial arts don't understand. So by doing these live events around the world, it's allowed me to impact a lot of people. But obviously my goal is, is to do a million uh, through the book and through, and through my live tours. And then we have a, a, a licensed program called Bully Proof Fitness that we'll be launching uh, probably in June of this year, where schools uh, can get this and have it and bring it in there. But the live events are great because when I go to these martial arts schools, not only is it a win for them in the community, but I'm able to get them anywhere from 10 to 25 brand new members at that location before I walk out the door. So it's kind of cool because not only do the, people, the parents get a copy of my book or they'll get an autograph, you know, picture from the Mortal Kombat movie, um, but they'll also... Uh, be able to get new members into their school, which is what, if you're in business, that's what you need to survive is new members constantly coming in. Definitely so. Fantastic, Chris. I'll, I'll link to, I'll definitely link to the book, Bullyproof Fitness, Great. you mentioned. Yep. Yep. And the website is bullyprooffitness.com. All right. Ex- excellent. Any, anywhere else, if anybody wants more details about you and your mission, where could they, where could they visit? Uh, there's two great, first of all, I'm on all the social media platforms so they can follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, uh, YouTube, Facebook, everywhere. Uh, what I'll do, George, is I'll shoot you an email with all my links. So if you want to pop those in there, there's two websites they can find me at, of course, my name, chriscasamassa.com. And then if they're interested in helping me uh, coach them, consult or advise them how to grow their business, they can go to my, my coaching site, which is thedojodoctors.com. Excellent. Chris? Be great speaking to you and look forward to meeting you in San Diego. Awesome, George. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks, Chris. All right, man. Take care.